Hello everyone. Today we are going to perform the buckling test. For that we need the buckling test apparatus. And few of struts or bars, we call them struts or bars, and a measuring tape and a vernier caliper like this. So those are the apparatus required for this buckling test. The purpose of this buckling test is compare the oiler's buckling load with experimental buckling load. So what is buckling? Buckling is a scenario that will occur only in compressive members. Buckling will never occur in tensile members. I will show you what is buckling. So I have a linear member like this. If I apply a compressive force like this, you can see in the transverse direction there is an excessive deflection. So that scenario called buckling. So if I apply a tensile force like this, you can see the buckling will never occur. It will only occur in compressive members. So in civil engineering field, there are a lot of compressive members. So there are two ways that a compressive member can fail. Therefore, the compressive members can be classified into two ways depending on the failure amount of those compressive members. If we compress a member and it fails due to material crushing, we call that a short column. For example, if you compress a concrete cube, it will fail due to material crushing. So that is called a crushing failure. The other way is the buckling failure. And if we apply a force and it fails due to buckling, that member is classified as slender column. So columns basically can be classified into short columns and slender columns. And this is Euler formula which is used for calculating the theoretical buckling load. In that P is the buckling load. For example, if we apply certain force, this member will buckle. So at the moment that the member buckles, the given force is called buckling load. And the next parameter is E. E is called the Young's modulus or modulus of elasticity. So it's a property depending on the material. If we take two columns with same properties but different Young's modulus, for example, plastic column and a steel column, Steel column is very hard to buckle. Plastic column will buckle very easily compared to the steel column. The reason is the steel column has a higher Young's modulus. Therefore, it has a higher buckling load. The plastic column, on the other hand, has a low buckling load because it has a low Young's modulus. The other parameter is I. I is second moment of area or the axis of buckling. Now in this column we have the cross section. So we can calculate the I value or second moment of area for two axes, this axis and the horizontal axis. But the member will be buckled over the axis where the buckling load is lowest. If we calculate the second moment of area along this axis, the second moment of area will be higher. If we calculate the second moment of area over this axis, it will be low. So the critical I value is the lowest one. Therefore, buckling will occur over this axis, like this. So here you can clearly see some line. So that is not the buckling axis. Buckling axis will be this one because the lowest I value occur over this line. Then the other parameter is LE. LE is the effective length of the column. 
Euler found that the buckling will depend on the end condition of the collar. So if the end conditions are pin, pin or simply held like this, it will buckle to a different shape and it will easily buckle. And if end conditions are fixed like this, it will buckle to a different position like this. Therefore, buckling will depend on its end condition. So, depending on the end condition, we will introduce a new parameter called effective length. Then there is another parameter called slenderness ratio. Slenderness ratio equals to effective length divided by radius of gyration. So slenderness ratio is a parameter which effect for the buckling directly. If the slenderness ratio is higher, it means the member is more tense to buckle. If the slenderness ratio is lower, it means there is a lower tendency to buckle. What is radius of gyration? It's the square root of I divided by cross-sectional area. So as we know, there are two I values for two directions in the cross-section. There are two radius of gyrations. We have to take the lowest radius of gyration along this axis because it's a critical value. Another important thing that you have to know is major axis and minor axis of a cross section. If we consider this cross section, this axis contains the highest I value, which is the major axis. The other axis contains the lowest I value, which is the minor axis. So that is the difference between major and minor axis. Buckling will normally happen over the minor axis of the column. If the column is restrained through the minor axis direction, buckling can be happen over the major axis also. So, if the machine represents this metallic part and this strut is the member, this is like a fixed end connection. Because the member cannot independently take a rotation, from this machine part. Therefore, it's a fixed end. But if you consider the total member as a timber member, and if this is the machine part, along this one, it can rotate easily. Right? Like this. It can rotate along the machine part. Therefore, this condition is called pin end condition. In our machine, we have a pin end condition. First, note down the length of the strut. It's 876 millimeters. Total length, which means from this end to this end. Then using vernier caliper, measure the depth and breadth of this strut in three different locations. So I will take this one and measure it from the end, middle and the other end. Those are the three locations that I am going to take the depth and breadth. So take the vernier caliper and measure the breadth. Tighten the screw. Read the value. It's 12.8 millimeters. It's here. 12.8 millimeters. Likewise, you can take all the measurements. So we have taken this measurement 
then take this depth at top of the collar then at the middle breadth B and depth then at the end take the breadth as well as the depth that's for bar A for bar number B you have to take that again let's record the value 876 millimeters B1 12.8 millimeters likewise fill all the values now set this strut correctly to the instrument like this now tidy it just a bit don't tidy it too much only just a bit so this is a jack which will apply a force to the spring and we know the spring constant of this spring then we can calculate the displacement using this dial gauge if we know the displacement and the spring constant of the spring we can calculate the force that applied to this strut then we can measure the displacement of this strut using this bar first take the initial reading of the dial gauge to calculate the force applied by this spring to the strut first take the initial reading of the dial gauge it's zero millimeters then apply some force and take the next read it's 52.52 millimeters then apply another small force and take the read then apply another force and take the read likewise keep it doing for several times until the column fails due to buckle take the measurement now i can take the middle reading or the end reading i'll prefer to take the end reading it's 20 millimeters so this is what will happen when i apply the force one by one so i'll rotate the jack and apply the spring force by one millimeter by one millimeter now i'm going to apply the force one millimeter two three millimeter four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty ah now you can see if i apply more force what will happen the buckling will happen that's a sudden movement one practical error is we are using a ruler to measure the deflection in this strut so what will be the practical problem is the minimum reading of the ruler is one millimeter that is not that much small so if we use a dial gauge to read this one this reading what will happen some small force will be applied by the dial gauge to the strut so that will create some error because actually there should not be a transverse force when we buckle this strut so what is the possible solution for this i suggest to have a vernier reading 
between these two a vernier reading attached to the strut and the main reading attached like this another error is we are considering this metallic part and the wooden part completely as a strut but the Young's modulus of the steel is different than the wood therefore there will be an error when we calculate in the Young's modulus of the member as well as the cross section is different in this small part another error is cross section can be different in each and every location of the strut to minimize that we have taken cross section details in three different sections and average value has been taken another error is timber is not a homogeneous material therefore material properties can be changed to different places in this timber so this place can be hardened then this place therefore material properties can be changed from point to point in timber and also timber is not a isotropic material which means properties are different from two different directions the properties along the grains are different than the perpendicular to the grains and the Young's modulus of this timber material can be changed due to the time variation Euler has derived the equation for a linear strut but this member is buckled several times therefore the linearity is now beta question so this is not a hundred percent linear strut therefore another error comes with the linearity of the strut and pin member is actually having zero roughness but practically there is no hinge having zero roughness